talking about uh, decision trees and uh, yeah maybe we should uh, look at this example again um, so basically it's it's really very easy so what uh, we do have in in our skiing example this uh, little file of training data in each line there is one data sample and we have the three um, uh, variables three input variables snow disk weekend and sun <coughs> and our classification uh, or our class variable is skiing yes or no they are all binary variables um, and this implies that our decision tree will be a tree with a branching factor of two and now here we so the first thing we have to do if we do it in this simple and naive way is we select um, an order of the variables so we start and this is just an arbitrary decision we start with this variable snow disk and now as an input we have all our training data the, the full set of training data um, and now this variable splits our training data up all variables with snow disk uh, sorry all, all samples with snow disk less than or equal to 100 go to the left here huh? and as you can see the, the tree stops here because all these training data are classified correctly um, and we get the decisions keying yes now in the other case we have these training data and they are they are not yet so we don't have a unique decision here and therefore we use the next variable weekend which splits up the data even more and here in this case we have a unique decision too for these three variables is that correct snow disk greater 100 week and no week and no yes and then we have the decision no okay and down here uh, similarly yes so this is the simple and naive way to build up such a decision tree um, and I mean programming this procedure is not really difficult um, but the thing here is that we are happy to use the actually the optimal order of the variables if we would have used a different order of these three variables the tree wouldn't look that nice the tree would actually be uh, much bigger as you can see the tree is so small because we were lucky and could stop here at this node if not maybe we would get a full subtree here so it's crucial to use a good variable order and what is a good variable order that's the question no? I mean the the variable that I use first must be uh, we might say kind of selective uh, um, or um, the using the, the correct variable gives us a, a big information gain so we are, we are now talking about information gain uh, how much information uh, do I uh, get from using the correct variable or a bad variable 
That's the question. And we will look at this now closer. Um, yeah. So we, we, we need, we need, um, we need uh, to know about the information content of our data. What is the information content of our data? Uh, um, and the interesting question is, what is the information content of our data? Let's look at the, the tree again. What is the information content of this original data set? This is question number one. And the next question is, after applying this variable, we split up our data in this data, in this subset number one and in this subset number two. And now the question is, what is the information content after applying this variable? So we will compare the information content of the original data set and the information content of this data set. Huh? Uh, look, for example, at, at this data set. The question is, how much information do I have about our class variable skiing? Look, here, here we have perfect information. We know that on all these four days, the correct decision is skiing. Huh? So, perfect information Whereas here, we do, we do not have perfect information because on some of the days, at least on these four, skiing is yes and uh, I don't know, on, on most of the others, it's, it's no. So what I, what I want to have is, I, I want to use a variable that splits up the data Ideally, in a way where I have the yes set here and the no set here. That would be perfect. Huh? Okay. And we will use the entropy as a metric for information content. Now, let's look at this training data set. So, we have two, four, six samples with the class yes and five with the class no. Huh? It's almost a symmetric split of our data. So the probability for yes is 6 over 11 and for no 5 over 11. And this gives us a probability distribution with these two probability values. The sum of course is one of these two values yeah. And we, I mean, we, we know about the entropy already. And if you see such a distribution, um, what would you say about the entropy of this distribution of two, uh, of two probability values? Is this uh, a high entropy? Does this have high entropy or low entropy? What do we remember about entropy? <coughs> what does high entropy mean? High entropy means low information contents. Huh? Um, or, in other words, it means high uncertainty. The highest uncertainty would be um, one half, one half. Huh? Because then I know nothing about my decision. Huh? And this is as close as it can be to one-half, one-half. So that means uh, this distribution 
has high entropy so, or uh, little knowledge about the decision. Okay, yeah. I mean, in general, we have a probability vector of length n uh, with this normalization condition. And, yeah, and, and the two extreme cases. In this case, I have perfect knowledge. I know that the, this first event occurs all the time, so the, this is the, the true event, um, and the others, they occur never. Uh, so here I have perfect information. I cannot have more information than here. And in this case, uh, I have uh, little information. Uh, so here I have maximum uncertainty. Okay, yeah, and I mean now I want to uh, give an, an easy and simple derivation of the, of the entropy formula. Last time when we talked about maxent, I just uh, gave you the entropy formula, but now I want to give some arguments why this is uh, why this is a good formula. Okay. Now, yeah, Claude Shannon, he was the inventor of the uh, uh, entropy. No, he didn't in, invent the entropy function, but uh, he, he proposed the entropy as a metric for information content. And he asked the question, how many bits would be needed to, to, to encode such an event? Huh? How many bits would I need to encode this? And how many bits would I need to encode this? Yeah? I mean, here, if this is my distribution, then, I mean, I, I can be sure all the time that event number one occurs. Yeah? So I don't need any bits to encode which one of the n events is it. Yeah? Now, here in this case, I have n outcomes of my experiment, n different outcomes. And the probability for all these n different outcomes is the same. Now, how many bits do I need to encode? Let's take an example from computer science. Huh? Um, suppose there is um, some connection, a wire, and at the end of this wire, I see characters. Huh? A, B, C, D, and some other characters. And we do have 256 different characters that may appear. How many bits do I need to encode them? How, how many bits do we need to encode 256 different characters? Eight. Eight, of course, yeah. Why? Because this is the, the binary logarithm of 256. Or I mean, if you, you can view it the other way around, if I have n bits, I can encode uh, 2 to the power n different events. Yeah? So that's why we come to this binary log n. Yeah? And this is, I mean, this is true. This is the minimal number of bits I need if all these events do have the same probability. Yeah? Okay, but now, now we look at the general case. I mean, these are the two extreme cases. The general case is this one. So my probability vector consists of n different probabilities. Um, and now let me write these probabilities in this way. So P1, so I just take the, 
uh, reciprocal of, P, of P1, which is M1. And I write P1 as 1 over M1, and so on for all the others too. <coughs> Okay, yeah. I do this because I want to uh, to get to the to this log two. You see the 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 probabilities they were one over n. Yeah? I have n events all with the same probability, uh, so the probability is one over n. And you see we got log two n bits for all these events. And now Analogously, um, if I have 1 over m1 as the first probability, then I need log 2 of mi bits for all these n events. Huh? So that's the number of bits I need for event number 1, 2, and so on. Okay, and now the question is, what is the expected value for the number of bits? Yeah, now I just use our, uh, the well-known formula for the expected value of uh, n uh, over n events. Yeah? So this is the number of bits, binary log of mi. We have to multiply it with the probability pi and the sum over, the, over this whole thing. Now mi was 1 over pi, and, and this is minus the log of pi, so we get the minus sign before the sum, sum over pi log pi. Huh? Okay. And now what we have here is the expected value for the number of bits I need. Huh? And I need the more bits, the higher the uncertainty is of my distribution. If the uncertainty uh, is zero, then I need zero bits. Yeah. And this function h is called the entropy. And the entropy is a metric for the uncertainty of a probability distribution. Huh? So now if I, um, if I want to measure the information content, then I mean I could use the negative entropy. So I just delete this minus sign here. Or I mean it doesn't matter. We could also use 1 minus the entropy. Yeah, any questions about this uh, derivation of the entropy function? Yeah, okay, yeah, and we, we do have a little problem which is um, if one of the probability values is zero, then um, one element of this sum is zero times log zero. Huh? And this is undefined because the logarithm of zero is undefined. So the question is what to do, and, and I mean, this occurs very often that probabilities are zero. Huh? What to do? Yeah, the point is that um, I mean, log of zero is undefined, but um, the, the limit of, yeah, let's go to the board. The limit of x times log x for x towards uh, zero is well defined. Uh, um, and this is zero. And because this limit is well defined, 
we can define 0 log 0 as 0. And now we can, uh, we can compute the entropy of any distribution. For example, the entropy of this distribution where we have uh, one, one value as being 1 and all the others are 0. And, uh, and this is 0. Yeah? Because 1 times log 1 is 0 and 0 times log 0 is 0 too, so all the elements of the sum are 0 and the entropy is 0. And here, uh, this, the entropy of the uh, uniform distribution is uh, log n. And this is actually the, the maximum of the entropy. So at this point in our n-dimensional space, uh, we have the entropy maximum. Yeah, look, uh, let's look at this special case. Uh, this is um, the case where I have two events with two probabilities, P1 and P2. And because the sum of these two has to be 1, we can write it in this way. Um, so the entropy of this distribution um, is P1 times log P1 plus 1, min 1 minus P1 times log 1 minus P1. And if we look at this function, you see this, uh, this function depends on one variable only, on P1. Yeah? If we look at this function, that's the graph we get. Yeah? It is symmetric with respect to 0.5. And we see the maximum of the entropy is here in the middle at P equal 0.5. That's the point of maximum uncertainty. And this point and this point, these are the two points of maximum certainty or minimum uncertainty. Okay, and in the following, I mean, now we get back to our um, decision tree algorithm. And here, the, the input for the, for the procedure is a data set. Yeah? And, but our data set comes with a probability distribution. So instead of uh, using such a probability vector, the input for the entropy will be a data set and then we compute the probability distribution for the data set so we can apply uh, the entropy to a data set as well as to a uh, distribution. Huh? And now uh, because we need to have a metric for the information content uh, we will define the information of our data set as 1 minus the entropy. Okay, and now uh, in the next step, let's, uh, let's look back at our decision tree. Yeah, here. We want to have a metric for the information gain. Yeah? So this distribution has some information content. And now after splitting up, I get two new distributions with some information content. And the idea is, uh, we want to know the information gain. So the question is, using this variable here gives us which information gain? What is the information gain from using this vari variable? Huh? Um, and what we do is, we compute the information content of this distribution, the information content of this, and the information content of this. Now, we have three distributions. Uh, now, what we do is we take the, the average information content of these two distributions 
and compare it with the original one. Yeah. And that's what we do here. So the original distribution was uh, 6 over 11 and 5 over 11 and the, uh, if we compute the entropy it is 0 0.994. Uh? And now the information gain is, um, yeah, um, let's see. I mean the information contents here is 1 minus this value. And this is what we have here. So now what, what, what we do is, this is the average information content after splitting up minus the original information content, this is the information gain. Uh, um, and now, what do we have here? Look, I of di, this is the information contents of the two new data sets after splitting up. And what we have here is, this is just the, the relative frequency of our data. So if the data are being split up as four elements in the left subtree, uh, four data samples in the left subtree, so we have four over 11, and in the right subtree we have seven over 11. But let's look at the example, yeah. So this is the formula for the information gain again. Yeah? And now in order to get back to the entropy, um, information gain is 1 minus the entropy here and 1 minus the entropy here. Um, yes, so this, let's see, how do we get? Yeah, so if we split up this sum here, we take this part this gives us a 1. Because the sum over these relative frequencies is 1 times 1 is 1. So we can take this 1 out of the sum and what remains is this part in the sum times this ratio uh, minus 1 plus h of d. And you see these two ones they cancel out <coughs> and what we get is the entropy of the original data set minus the average entropy of our split up data sets. So this is the formula and here we have the entropy which was 0.994 and then 4 over 11 times the entropy of the left data set plus 7 over 11 times the entropy of the right data set which finally gives us 0.445. And this is the information gain from using this variable SNOWDIST. Huh? Okay, so now we know th using this variable as the first, as the root node in our tree gives us this information content. And what we have to do now is to compute the information uh, the information gain for all the other variables. And for weekend we get 0.15. So you see SNOWDIST is much better than weekend. And what about SUN? Uh, oh, SONNE. We get 0 0.049, which is even smaller. Huh? Um, yeah, here we have it in comparison again. Huh? Here are the three variables and the information gain yeah and uh, in order to understand uh, intuitively what happens just look at these distributions here we have the original distribution so the, the original distribution which is um, skiing yes on six days and, f and no on five days is that correct? Was it six yes and five no or, or the other way? Yeah? Okay. So we have six yes and five no. 
And now this variable splits up our data in this data set and or this is the distribution, not the data. We get these two new distributions and look, this distribution has very high um, information content. This is actually maximum. Huh? Um, this is not so good, but if we, if we look uh, at, uh, uh, at this uh, case where we use weekend, um, so this distribution is much better than this. And uh, yeah, no, I mean, look, this, these two distributions do have the same information content. These two have the same information content, but this one is much better than this. And that's why we get uh, higher information gain here. Huh? And now if we look at this example, then we see here we have higher information content in the, in the left case, and here we have higher information content than here. Uh, and therefore, the information gain here is higher than you see. So what we want is that applying a variable in a decision tree, we want ideally after applying the variable to have such a case. So some number and zero on the other side. Huh? because this gives us uh, most information gain. Yeah. Okay. Um, Now, once we, um, so we will of course decide to use this variable as the, as the root variable. And after applying this variable, we have this data set. That's what we call D less than or equal to 100. And we have this data set, D uh, greater than 100. Here the tree immediately stops because we, we have a perfect decision. Huh? But here we have to continue and look whether other variables uh, give us some information gain. So now we consider this um, subset of the data, which is, this is D greater than 100. And now we look, uh, now we have uh, two possibilities left for applying variables. We can apply weekend and we can apply sun. So again, we compute the information gain for the variable weekend, which is 0.292, and for the variable sun, which is 0.17. So of course, we decide to use weekend as, uh, as the next attribute. Huh? And for weekend uh, equal no, the tree terminates with the decision no. And for weekend yes, um, we apply the, the variable sun um, and uh, get this gain. Yeah, that's finally how we construct the tree. And this is the resulting tree. This is actually the same tree as we had it uh, in, the, in the first picture. Okay. Now there are um, a couple of different implementations of this algorithm. And so the, yeah, the best known and most popular system uh, until at least a couple of years ago uh, was C4.5, um, which comes from uh, Ross Quinlan. And uh, C4.5 is a successor 
of his original system, which was ID3. Uh, ID3 was one of the first decision tree algorithms. Um, and now there is even a successor of C4.5, which is C5.0. Uh, um, yeah. And this is, I mean, C4.5 and C5, uh, both are uh, available open source, meanwhile. These are just C programs which you can use on the command line. Then there is CART, a uh, well-known system too, from Leo Brayman. Uh, he is, or at least at that time, he worked at the uh, University in Berkeley. Um, it's quite similar to C4.5, but the difference is CART has a really advanced graphical user interface, but it's extremely expensive, so it costs thousands of dollars. Um, so it's no, it's no longer an alternative. I mean, I guess there are some companies who pay the money, but uh, there is uh, better stuff available. Um, yeah, and I mean, th there is also this system, which is not popular, but it should be mentioned because this was actually the first in 1964, the first decision tree algorithm, but it never became uh, popular. Um, yes, and there is, I will, I will show you when we, when we will talk about data mining, this k tool, which is a, a data mining workbench um, developed in uh, University of Konstanz. And, uh, but what's, what's actually here very important is k uses the VK library. VK is a Java library with machine learning algorithms. And this library, meanwhile, is very popular. Um, and the VK library contains an implementation uh, or a re-implementation of C4.5. I guess it's called J4.8, something like that. Uh, but it's, it's the same algorithm. It's the same algorithm. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And uh, so maybe we should, uh, we should look into, uh, into C4.5 now. I'll, I'll show you the application of C4.5. Um, yes. So maybe we start here on the slides. Um, for, so for our key data set, um, we we use an input file with the extension dot data, and all the attribute values they can be written as ASCII. Uh, and a comma separated and one data sample per line. So that's the, the data file. And then we need such a dot names file and the dot names file describes the attributes. All the lines with this vertical bar uh, are comment lines. And this first line here gives us the classes. We do have the classes for skiing no and yes. Uh, and that's what we describe here. And uh, this is the description of all the variables. Snow dist with the two values. So here you see we define the, the values, the symbolic values. This is value number one and this is value number two. And for weekend we have no and yes and for sun two. Uh, okay, so this is it's quite easy to use. You, you just need these two, two input files and then you can apply um, C4.5. Let's see. Yeah. Is this big enough? The, the font? Okay. Oh, 
Okay, yeah. Okay, so the, the program C4.5 is being applied, so the name is just C4.5. And now, yeah, now we, we, we use it on our LexNet data. And let's look at such a data file. Um, this, is, this is the data file for the LexNet data. Um, oh yes, and, and if we want to know a description of the variables, we look at the .names file. Yeah, and here we see the, we have the two classes, appendicitis negative and positive, um, described by zero and one, and here we have all the attributes, Alter, Geschlecht, and so on. Um, yeah. Yeah, and what's interesting here is most of the variables are binary, but some of the variables they are treated as continuous here. For example, the age. The age which is not really continuous, but the age has something like 100 different uh, values, and this is normally too much for a discrete classification. So we treat this variable as continuous and also these fever values and the leukocyte value, they are also treated as continuous. And we have to look into this because now we don't know how uh, our decision tree algorithm can work with continuous variables, but we will look into this. Okay, no, oops. Wenn ich mich recht erinnere, war das Alter noch in zehn Kategorien unterteilt oder so, wie die Zyklen auch bei dem Lexmeet. Ach ja, das stimmt, genau. Da hätte man auch diese Kategorien reinschreiben können. Yes, we, we could do that, yeah. So we could use the discretization we had in LexMate. That would be possible. But um, actually what we did in LexMate was uh, kind of an ad hoc discretization. We talked to the doctor and asked him which, uh, um, which age intervals would he use. But here we will see what, uh, what C4.5 does it finds an optimal discretization by itself. So we, we, if we treat the variable as continuous, then we will see that the C4.5 algorithm finds a very good discretization, and so we just leave this open and look what uh, C4.5 finds. Yeah? But you're right, we, we, could, we could, of course, use our discretization that we uh, want or would prefer. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, so now we apply C4.5 um, minus F up 1, so we, we just have to give as this first argument the file name and then um, yeah, we, we can just apply it this way. Oh, type more. Okay, and you see we get a decision tree. So maybe we should look at this uh, in, in order to explain it. I mean, this is a, an ASCII representation of a tree. So the, the root node here is leukocytes less than or equal to 10,400. So you see how, how C4.5 treats our uh, continuous variables it makes binary variables out of them. Yeah? So we have now it produced a first binary variable called leukocytes less than or equal to 10,400. Yeah? So this is the first decision. Um, if this is true, then uh, we take uh, lokale Abwehrspannung as the next variable. If this is equal to zero, then we use Schmerzquadrant and so on. Yeah? 
And you see it's quite a, quite a big tree. So we already have a depth of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Huh? And it's even it's even deeper. Saying we have a depth of ten already, which is quite a large tree. Yeah, you really see it. <laughs> and what we have here is we, we even get a subtree because it gets too deep and that would be too wide uh, for, the, for the screen. So now we go into this first subtree, then there is a second subtree, and now we get a simplified decision tree. We will talk about this too later. So after producing the whole decision tree, uh, C4.5 starts pruning the tree. So it cuts off many branches of the tree and the tree becomes smaller. And that's what we have here. Now let's look at the simplified tree. Yeah, it's still bigger than one screen. So we have leukocytes less than or equal 10,400. And here we have the other branch, leukocytes uh, greater than 10,400. Yeah, and that's it. That's the whole tree. Um, and then down here we get some results. Yeah? Um, this is the, the size of the tree before pruning. So the tree had 139 nodes and after pruning it's only 51 nodes. Um, and what's interesting is that before pruning, the error rate is 11.3%. That means 11.3% out of our training data are uh, not correctly classified in the bigger tree. Now after pruning, the tree becomes smaller and therefore the, uh, the error rate is higher. Is this obvious? Yes, it is. Look at the training data. The training data set consists of 462 samples. How many nodes would I need in a tree such that for sure I can classify all, um, all training data samples correctly. Um, oh yes, uh, but and uh, so of course there are cases of training data where it is impossible to classify everything correctly. When is it impossible? Uh, in case of inconsistencies in the data. It may happen that there is one patient with a set of symptoms where we have diagnosis zero and the same patient with diagnosis one. This is an inconsistency or, or a, a, a contradiction. And such contradictions, they can never be classified correctly. But suppose, suppose we have no contradictions in our training data, then it may be possible to classify them all correctly. But then the tree would need to have at least as many nodes as we have uh, data samples. So we could, we could uh, produce one uh, leaf node for each one of the, uh, the data samples, which would then be like storing all the data and looking them up as kind of a table lookup, which is not what we want. Yeah? We want, of course, we want to have a tree which is much smaller than the size of our training data. <coughs> 
and that's why we use pruning okay but actually these numbers here they are not really interesting they are not interesting because testing our decision tree on the training data is not very useful why I mean it's in general testing a machine learning algorithm on the training data is not useful why doesn't that make much sense because the best learning algorithm if I test on the training data is just storing my training data I just store them in a file and then for testing I input my training sample and look in my file okay what is the class and I just take what I had in the training data so the best algorithm as long as I test on the training data is just storing the training data and that's what we, do, what we don't want. We want to have generalization and generalization means I have to use for testing I have to use different data which, which are previously unknown to the algorithm. Okay, so um, now we, we have to apply uh, C4.5 again um, and uh, use uh, a test data set and uh, if you look at the, uh, the di directory here you see this file up one um, there is a file there are three data files there is this file up one dot all then there is up one dot data and up one dot test uh, and these are the two relevant files the data are the training data and in test I have a set of test data uh, and now let's look at the size um, in up1.data there are 462 lines uh, which means 462 uh, training samples in, and in dot test we have 231 you see this is just half as much uh, what I did was I split up all my training data in two third as training data and one third as test data uh, and now if we apply C4.5 and want to use this test data file we use the minus u option and then uh, I mean we get the same tree everything the same but at the end uh, we get an evaluation on the test data too yeah? and that's interesting evaluation on training data that's the same as we had before and now this is the really interesting result on the test data before pruning the large tree gives me an error of 32 percent on the training data um, uh, sorry uh, sorry this is 32 percent on the test data before pruning and 30 percent uh, after pruning and now can you understand what happens here look here on the training data the error after pruning is higher and on the test data the error after pruning is lower I mean the first thing I hope we understood this what's the reason why the error after pruning is higher on the training data I 
Yeah. Don't have these many paths for the special cases. Yes. The tree is smaller, so I cannot represent all these cases anymore. Yeah? That's the reason why the error is higher after pruning. Now, how is it on the test data? Why is the error after pruning on the smaller tree, the error is smaller than on the bigger tree? Yeah, the reason is, I mean, this is the same tree here. This tree is better on our training data because it can represent specific details, particular details of my training data. And here I can even represent random noise in my decision tree. And random noise is not what we want to learn. Huh? Um, and that's why, look, compare these two numbers. We have 11% error on the training data, but 32% on the test data. And this shows us that we have overfitting here. Overfitting means my, my tree represents noise. Uh, my tree represents noise, which is not really useful. And if I test it on unknown test data, then we see the error is much higher than it was on the training data. So it doesn't make sense to use such a big tree. This really big tree represents noise and uh, therefore we have a much higher error on the, uh, on the test data. Huh? Yeah. Teil der Daten ich als Testdaten auswähle, wenn man zufällig die falschen Testdaten wählt, dann bekommt er das ist deutlich anders. Ja, genau. You're right. Uh, the, 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 the result here depends on which of the, the data are used as test data. But, I mean, it's not so sensible because we used quite a big number, 231 uh, test items, which gives us quite a good statistics. It would be really a severe problem if we would use only five uh, data for, for test data, uh, only five data samples. Then, of course, it strongly depends on which five we use for testing. But 232, uh, 31 gives quite a good statistics already. Yeah? But this is, I mean, it's, uh, this is an issue. The question is, how many out of my data? I mean, altogether we have 462 plus 231, which is 693. Uh, data samples altogether. Yeah? So we have around 700 training data and the interesting question is how many out of these will I use for training and how many for testing? Typically we want to use as many data for training because then the algorithm uh, will produce a better tree. But, I mean, yeah, if I have 700 data and I use 690 for training and only 10 for testing, then statistics for testing is too bad. Huh? And therefore, this is a trade-off. And what I did here is I used two-thirds for training and one-third for testing. Uh, if I have enough training data, I can do this. If we would have only 100 training data, then we would have um, a yeah, kind of a severe problem. Huh? But then still, there is a, a really good procedure, but this costs more computation time. So if, if data is really limited, suppose we would have 100 uh, training data, then we can do the following thing. We use 99 of them for training and only one for testing. Huh? Um, and we repeat this 100 times. 
So we take sample number one for testing in the first case, then sample number two in the second case. So we have to train 100 different decision trees and each one of them will be tested on one sample and then at the end we, we do have a statistics with 100 uh, samples. This is the, the so-called, I mean this process is called cross-validation. What we do here is cross-validation. Yeah? And this process of leaving one sample out is called the leave one out cross-validation scheme. And what we, do, what we have here is the, the one-third cross-validation scheme. And ideally, one would do the following. Um, so, yeah, let's talk about cross-validation. So, in the first step, we split up uh, our data our data set in, um, how would we, uh, in K parts. So now, suppose this is our data set, and now we split it up. So this is K equals 6 into six equal parts. And in the, in the second step, um, so we, we um, for k equal one to six, to um, use all except the K for training. Um, use DK for testing. So this is the loop and then after this loop terminates then we do average the error. Average the errors. Huh? And this is what we called k-fold cross-validation. Yeah? So we split up our training set into k equal parts and then we use this algorithm. Um, and uh, you see, this is not specific for decision tree learning. You can do it with any supervised learning algorithm. Yeah. Okay, is this clear now? Now let's go back to um, C4.5. Um, yes. I mean, what's kind of surprising still is that we have such a big difference here. I mean, this is not surprising. This is the, the tree before pruning. So we get a too big tree. This tree is too big. That's why the error on the training data is so small, because it learns noise. Huh? It learns random noise. Huh? Um, and that's why on the test data it's much worse. Um, but the difference between these two numbers, this difference uh, worries me a little bit because after pruning, we should prune out all these noise branches. 
And then this number should be quite close to this one. Uh, and they are too far apart. So that means this tree after pruning still represents random noise. So this is not really good. Um, and therefore, I can, in, in C4.5, there is one parameter that, <coughs> that we really can use effectively for pruning. It's the so-called minus M parameter. And this minus M parameter is really useful for, um, for reducing uh, such overfitting, such learning of noise. And the minus M parameter does the following. Suppose we have some node here and we split up this node and now here we would use some other node. But the, uh, the, the, the splitting up is only allowed if these subdata sets, so uh, let's suppose this is variable vi with the values, um, let's call them v plus and v minus, and the, this data set d, v plus, and these data sets d, v minus, the number of data in these two sets, if the, if the number of data becomes too small, suppose there is only one sample in here and, and the other sample in here, then what we do is we represent one single uh, training sample by a branch in the tree, which is not good. Yeah? Um, and we can, uh, we can limit, we can give a lower bound on the size of these subsamples, um, and I mean, what's uh, quite reasonable would be the bigger the number, the better. So we could use 100, for example, as a minimum size for these subsets, and then we have good statistics in the subtrees. Let's let's just do this. Yeah? Let's let's use 100 as an, a lower bound. There is this, it's a minus M parameter, 100. Yeah, and that's it. Here we have the tree. Decision tree. Leukocyten less than 10,400, zero. So that means send the patient home greater than 10,400 operation. That's a quite a simple tree. No? And uh, here in parentheses, you see the statistics. That means 192.4 samples um, are correctly classified when I say zero in this, in this subset and 63.4 are incorrectly classified. So, um, yeah. And here in this case, 269 correct and 59 incorrect. You see, the number of samples here is 250 around that, and here it's um, 330 something. Obviously, you, you see 250, 330. If we would do a further splitting up of the tree, then we would have some sub tree with less than 100 uh, samples. And now let's look at the results. Error before pruning 26.4%, after pruning 26.4% and on the test data 32 and 32. Now you can see what happens. Before we had this extremely large tree with uh, how many nodes? 1,000? I don't remember. Um, no, 130 something. Yeah? But now the, the tree has one node, uh, only one node. Uh? And with only one node, 
the tree has about the same quality as we had before with 132 nodes. Huh? Thirty-two percent error. No? I'm not sure. So you say the the amount of data is not big enough. This may be one reason, but actually I can tell you the real reason for, uh, for this high error rate here is different. The reason is inherent in the problem. The problem is difficult. Huh? So it is a difficult decision, which means in the training data there is quite a bit of inconsistencies. Huh? And this is because these training data are not perfect because the doctors that produce the training data they didn't know it better and this is always the question the question is is the high error rate due to uh, too small amount of uh, training data or is it due to a bad algorithm or is it due to bad quality of the training data these are the reasons we may have for bad classification. But now let's, let's try it again. Uh, but I mean, minus M100 is obviously too big because this makes us the tree as small as it can be. Oh no, it, uh, let's, let's use minus M300. We get an even smaller tree. This is the decision tree now. This tree has no node at all. This tree always says, do the operation. Because that's the best you can do. Oh, sorry. Um, let's look at the evaluation. We do have on training and test data an error of around 40%. Huh? Why? Let's look at the tree again. Here you see the statistics. Huh? Um, so 462 out of our training samples. No, oh yeah, see. Sorry, I, I misinterpreted this number. This is the number of all the samples I do have in this node and this is the number of errors. So 188 out of 462 are not correctly classified. Huh? So the evaluation on the training data, the error rate is 188 divided by 462, uh, which obviously is, what, what is it? 40%. Huh? Yeah, you, can, you see. 188 errors, which is 40.7%. <laughs> okay, so this is the smallest tree we can have, really. Now let's use a better minus M. How about M10? Um, yeah, this is the tree. Okay, you see the tree is no longer really big, and now we get the simplified decision tree, which is yeah, this is a reasonable size of a tree. Uh, the depth is one, two, three, four, five. And it doesn't have too many nodes. Yeah, and now let's look at the results. And you see the results are getting better. On the test data, after pruning, we do have 26%. And this is, I guess this is close to the optimal we can have. And also you see 
The difference between uh, the error on training and on test data is no longer so extremely big. We can use other values, let's say 20. Yeah, it's similar, so there is no big difference. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's basically what I wanted to show here. Or do you want to me to try something? Okay, so let's go back to the slides. Yeah, maybe we should look at the learning algorithm now. So it's this function generate decision tree and as an input we have the data set and a node, a node which is the starting node um, because we will call this algorithm recursively. Okay, and the first step, I mean this, we compute the information gain. Huh? We compute the information gain for all our attributes. And out of these, all these attributes, we select the, uh, the one attribute with the maximum information gain. Huh? Now we know A max is the attribute with maximum information gain. And now if the information gain of R max is equal to zero, I mean, then it's not useful to use any attribute. This is the case where we, um, we stop expanding the tree because it doesn't, <coughs> it doesn't help to use any attribute. Okay, so if this is the case, the, then the, the current node becomes a leaf node uh, with the most frequent class in data. Huh? So th then our node, um, suppose this is the new node, and our statistics is, so in, in C4.5 it would be uh, like, uh, for example, 466,188. And, and that means um, we have, I mean this was, what we had the 40% the error. So then we would say at this, it would be a leaf node, we would say one as the class, um, which is just a majority decision. Okay, node becomes a leaf node, else, so if the information gain of the best attribute is not zero, then we assign the attribute a max to the node. Yeah? Then we use the best attribute. And now, so yeah, that's, that's actually suppose this is here we use, yeah, let's draw a new picture. For our node, we use the attribute a max. And now what we do is, for all values of this attribute, huh, for each value a1 through an of a max, we generate a successor node. So we generate all these successor nodes. These are k1 through kn. And yeah, and now up here we had our data set D. Was it D? No, data. And now we split this data set up in the data sets 
d1 through dn. And what is di? The i-th data set is the set of data x with a max of x is equal to a i. And a i are the, the different values. So the, we have a 1, a 2, to a n. Yeah? And now d1 is the data set uh, where the attribute a max has the value a1. Okay, so we split up the data and now for all data sets 1 through n. Uh, um, so we go into, this is a loop over all these nodes, about, over all these subnodes. Uh, now we start with the first and if all uh, uh, samples in this data set belong to the same class. I mean, then we are finished. Then we make a leaf node out of this, generate, then we generate a leaf node Ki of class Ci. Huh? If we do not have a unique decision, then we do a recursive call of our generate decision tree algorithm and we just continue recursively, that's it. Okay, questions? Yeah, that's basically the algorithm to generate the tree. We did, we did not talk about the pruning, so we generate a tree which may be too large and uh, after that we will prune the tree. Okay, yeah. So this is our Lexmate uh, example again. Okay, and now we have to talk about some uh, specialities of uh, decision tree learning. First is continuous attributes. Yeah? How are continuous attributes being handled? And this is uh, I mean, this is a, a really a nice feature of the decision tree learning that it can automatically deal with continuous attributes. Huh? Um, for example, we, we have seen such a node which may be leukocytes greater than 11,030. Huh? Um, so what you see here is Obviously, this algorithm produces a threshold. It produces a threshold for the continuous attribute leukocytes. And having such a threshold makes a binary attribute out of our, our continuous attribute. Huh? Um, yeah. And how is the threshold? The threshold for this attribute A on the data set being determined. What we do is, yeah, suppose, let's look at such a, um, a set. So here we have zero and here we have, let's say, um, 50,000. Um, and this is the variable leukocytes. Leukocytes may have all these values between 0 and 50,000. Yeah? And now what I do in the first step, I use the smallest number that occurs in my data. Maybe it's 3,000. And now I test whether this, this smallest number that occurs may be a good threshold for leukocytes. And as soon as I know this variable, I have this binary variable leukocytes greater than 3000. And now when I have such a binary variable, I can immediately compute the information gain of this variable leukocytes greater than uh, 3000. Um, so I will compute the information gain for the threshold uh, 3000. 
Then I will compute the information gain for the threshold, let's say 4,300, which may be the next value that occurs, and so on. And finally, maybe I get 100 different thresholds, so I compute 100 times the information gain. And now, which threshold will I use? I will use this, the threshold, with the highest information gain. That's simple. So I get a, let's say, locally optimal threshold for this new binary variable, leukocytes greater than some threshold. So it's, it's really easy, easy and, and basic and intuitive. And with this procedure, my continuous variable will be converted into a binary variable. And now you might ask, does this make sense? Maybe I want to have uh, finally a discrete variable with seven intervals. Huh? This is impossible. I always get a binary variable. But you forgot to think of the recursive nature of our algorithm. Um, it may happen that, let's look at the example again, yeah. It may happen if I don't use the minus M option here, I get a quite a big tree. And here you see leukocytes greater than 10,400. Now if we go further down in the tree, you may see the variable again. Yeah, look here. Here we have the variable again, further down in the tree, and now the threshold is 6,900. So such a continuous variable may occur quite often in the tree, and it, it may even in the extreme case happen that the whole tree consists only of leukocyte decisions. Huh? And then at the end you may have a discrete uh, partitioning of the interval into 10 subintervals. So this is still possible and it, it all works automatically. So you get an, a fully automatic kind of optimal partitioning of your variable into subintervals. Okay, so I guess that's it now. Yeah, so that's how continuous attributes are being treated. And so next Monday we will continue and talk about uh, pruning and some other specialities of decision tree learning. Thank you.